Our lesson from the New Testament comes from the Acts of the Apostles. It's uh, the 8th chapter, verses 26 through 40. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So Philip got up and went, and now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and he asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth in his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? So he commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and he was passing through the region. He proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, brothers and sisters. It is beautiful, beautiful to see these two congregations gather together in fellowship this morning. I want to first say that I'm so thankful for the pastoral staff, the session, and the servants here of East Liberty Presbyterian Church who have made it possible for us to come and be with you this morning. And along with that, I want to say thank you to my congregation of Eastminster for being present and for our Pastor Paul and Reverend Nikki and our session for also making this possible uh, too. And furthermore, we get the gift of two choirs joining together and singing praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we need to say thank you to Ed and Michael from East Liberty and Nikki and Nemesio from Eastminster uh, for helping this come to pass. And all the crews that, that brings it to pass, all the people who sing, the production, all, all of them. It's truly a gift. You know, this is a momentous event if you think about it. Whereas these two neighboring churches gather together, we are getting to show this neighborhood that for all of our differences, we have something deeper in common something important, and that is this, that we are called by the Lord Jesus Christ to be ambassadors of God's love in word and in action in this neighborhood as faithfully as we can. Now, we might do that differently, but nevertheless, we have a similar call. And so thank you for participating and gathering in this way on this morning. May there be more to come, and may you be blessed in the common worship of our God. You know, as I was getting ready and thinking about my sermon, I began to think about the paths that we take to get to the places that we go. I imagine that some of you have come in on very familiar roads this morning, and others of you, well, you might have gotten lost coming down the block. Who knows? Sometimes that one unfamiliar street can throw you off. But in all seriousness, there's something about the paths that we take that can shape our lives and determine the places that we go and the people that we will encounter and even the ways that we will understand the gospel of Jesus Christ in this world. There's something powerful about the paths that we take in our day-to-day -day lives. A few years back when I came to Eastminster, I started to take walks through this neighborhood. 
You see, I'm not from the East End. I'm not even really from Pittsburgh, so don't hold that against me. I was unfamiliar with this place, though, and I wanted to discover its neighborhoods. I wanted to discover its shops and the roads that people travel on as they move through this part of town. And initially, I would go in all different directions. I would walk through the neighborhood of Larimer. Then I would go up through Highland Park. Then I would come down Baum and Center and venture into Shady, Shady Side. In other words, I went into a lot of different directions because I had never been here before, and these paths were all unfamiliar to me. But then something began to change. I started to walk upon a path that I liked. I would come down east from Eastminster on Highland Avenue and walk past this church at the intersection of Penn, and then I would go on to Walnut Street, uh, all the way down to Walnut Street, where I would take a left and then go back up the Shady Avenue and then head back this way so that I could walk past Target and the East End Cooperative Ministry until finally I was back at Eastminster. I liked that path. I liked that I knew the amount of time that it would take for me to get back to the church so that I could start my day. I liked that I could see the familiar faces of unfamiliar people because they were out at the same time of day every morning as me, taking the path that they were accustomed to take. And I also liked that I could pray and meditate as I walked along that path because I didn't have to think about where I was going, you know? I liked that path so much that it's the only path I take now whenever I go out for a morning walk. It has become habitual to me so that even when I want to discover something new, I find it challenging to take a different path other than the one that has been carved in my mind for my morning walk. You know, I wonder if you can relate to this in some way. I wonder if you also know the power of the familiar path and how you keep traveling on it because of the habits that you have formed or the efficiency that you have discovered in traveling it or just the scenery that you like to see every day as you go along that same path. There's power in the familiar path to keep us walking on it. And in light of our historic faith, we might say that this is not an altogether bad thing. In fact, the Bible uses the imagery of a path to speak, to speak about the familiar way of our faith and how it can lead us into the goodness and blessings of God's kingdom. I mean, listen to what the psalmist spoke this morning in the reading of Scripture. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. God leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep His covenant and His decrees. This is a good path to become familiar with and to travel on day after day after day. Amen? But, sometimes we travel familiar paths even when they do not bring us in or when they keep us away from what God would have for us. Let me explain. Years ago, my wife, Ayana, who's also a pastor, she and I served a church together in Kansas City, Missouri. And our church was in an interesting location. It was right next to a street that was called Troost Avenue. And Troost Avenue was a major thoroughfare that ran north and south through Kansas City. In other words, it divided east from west. But it was a significant road for different reasons. For Troost was the dividing line between black and white. It was the dividing line between the areas of the city that were resourced and the areas that were allowed to wither away. It was that infamous red line that was put into place in the early 1900s by the local government and banks and home ownership associations that, might, that they might determine who belonged where and who could thrive or wither according to where they lived in relationship to that street. In other words, Troost Avenue was the way that racial injustice was perpetuated in Kansas City. And here's the thing. Those racial injustices that had been embedded into the actual road system of Kansas City way back in its history still affected that community when we were there many years later. 
In other words, people still traveled along their familiar paths, seeing their familiar people based upon where Truest Avenue was in their lives. And I would say that mostly everyone that I met did not want this to be the case. It's just that so often people stay on the roads that they know. But friends, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ breaks into this and says, not the Lord. For the Lord is the spirit of the road, as one scholar named Willie James Jennings writes, meaning that the Lord does not stay on the same paths that have always been tread, or keep God's people on the same roads that they have always taken, because so often we stay on the roads that we have always traveled just because those roads are familiar, even if they prevent God's kingdom work from taking place in our lives. And so the Lord does something different. And we get to see that in the book of Acts. For in this story, God's Holy Spirit from the very beginning moves the disciples out onto unfamiliar roads that they might go to unfamiliar places and there encounter unfamiliar people who will reveal to them the transforming love of God in Jesus Christ. I mean, take for instance the story that we read this morning of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. It begins with an angel of the Lord saying to Philip, get up and go down south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is a wilderness road. But here's the thing. The story does not actually begin there. It begins at the beginning of chapter 8 when we read that a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. And those who were scattered went from place to place proclaiming the word. And so as we pick up with the passage that we read this morning, we need to know that Philip was moved by God's spirit into an unfamiliar place. We might even say that it was a place that Philip didn't want to go, or a scary place, because as the great reformer John Calvin mentioned in his commentary on this passage, this was called a wilderness road because it led into a land that had been laid waste by the Greek emperor Alexander the Great. In other words, for a Jew, this road would have a lot of bad history on it. But Philip got up and went. In other words, he responded faithfully to God's movement to go check out a new path and see what God might bring forth if he were to respond. So he got up and he went. Brothers and sisters, I don't know if most of you know the history of where this gathering of our two churches came from on this morning. But its genesis happened in a seminary class that I took alongside one of your pastors here at East Liberty Presbyterian Church, and I'm referring to the Reverend Patrice fowler Sursi. Anyways, we were coming to the end of our class when our professors announced what our Doctor of Ministry project was going to be for that class, and it was that we were going to have to take a calculated risk in our ministry co context. And I've got to be honest with you, when I first heard the assignment, I thought to myself, oh my goodness, here's more work to do. In other words, I was just thinking about it as I've always thought about my other assignments, personal and something to get done. It's not to say I'm having a bad time in my ministry with the D-Men project, but sometimes you get a lot of work with it, you know? But Patrice came over to me and she said this, Aaron, I think we should work together on this. I think our two congregations need to do something together. And from that, she helped to fashion the idea and bring it about so that our pastoral staffs began to meet and get to know each other better so that eventually Pastors Randy and 
Pastor Paul got members of our sessions together and they began to form this idea of a joint worship service between Eastminster and East Liberty Presbyterian Church. All of this because Patrice, our sister, was willing to get out on a new path. Even a path that may have a little bit of troubled history on it, we might say. A wilderness road of some sorts. But she was willing to get out on it and check what God might do if she were faithful to that call. Faithful to that call. And what is it that God does when we follow the movement of the Holy Spirit to get on a new path or a new road? What does God do through that? Well, let's look back at the story we read this morning. Philip was sent out by an angel of the Lord, and he went onto a new path, and there he encountered an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. And this eunuch was in charge of the queen's entire treasury. In other words, the eunuch had power and authority, but only as a total and complete slave to his queen. It's thought that servants were made eunuchs in royal courts so that any vestiges of their personal selves would be removed. You see, their bodies would be altered in such a way that they would become known only as property and not a person, quote-unquote. And for this reason, both Jew and Gentiles rejected eunuchs, saying that they had no appropriate place in the spiritual and social community. But nevertheless, God was at work on this new path. And there Philip encountered the eunuch reading the word of God and wondering about it. And so Philip ran up to him and asked what he was reading. And from that, the proclamation of the good news about Jesus took place, leaving the eunuch to exclaim, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? In other words, he saw that in God's household, on account of Jesus Christ, he was forgiven, loved, and known as a person made in the image of God. And Philip saw the same thing. Therefore, he baptized the eunuch, meaning that they were now bound together as siblings in the kingdom of God. This is a powerful testament to what the presence of God can do whenever we respond to the movement of God's Spirit and set out on a new path. But I want to point out something. The story of Philip and the eunuch in the book of Acts, it ends here. In other words, after this, they are no longer mentioned. Even though their story is something special, it ends right here in the book of Acts. And the reason for this is that this is not really a story about Philip and the eunuch. But rather, it is a story of how God gets the church to move in a new direction as they are faithful to his call. After this story, Saul becomes Paul and is sent out to the Gentile world. After this story, Peter is sent out to Cornelius and his household so that the church comes to understand that God's love in Jesus Christ is not just for them, but for the world. God got Philip onto a new path so that God might bring forth something bigger than Philip and the eunuch. I say that because I wonder if something similar might be happening here. I don't want you to get me wrong. I am hopeful that East Minster and East Liberty will nurture a friendship between our congregations. I'm hopeful that we will deepen our mutual places of ministry in this neighborhood. But I suspect that God is not just about that when it comes to God's church. I think God wants something more. What is that more? He wants us to witness the Lord, God, wants us to witness in this neighborhood that God is here not just for us, but for the world. That God is at work not just in our churches, but in the roads, 
the businesses, and the homes of this neighborhood. God is at work in your life, in the life of this church of East Liberty Presbyterian, and in the life of East Minster. But God is at work in the world. And this connection between us, whatever may come of it, whatever joy you might find in it, may it be a connection that becomes fruitful, not just for ourselves, but for God's work in this neighborhood. That's the word that I would like to leave us with this morning. Be mindful of the path that you take. You will travel some familiar paths, but do not keep yourself from going down those unfamiliar paths where God will lead you into new relationships, new places, and new work. In the name of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.